So um, welcome everybody here to the Martin e. Siegel Theater Center at the Graduate Center CUNY. I'm, I'm live here I'm at the uh, Graduate Center, which is on 34th Street and Fifth Avenue, close to the New York um, Public Library. And this is an event uh, we added on very short notice um, to our uh, program. We have with us uh, the great Milo Rao, the Swiss uh, theater maker, uh, game leader and uh, inventor um, of, of new rules or applying old rules to the world of theater. And this evening is dedicated to Navalny and um, his uh, his work, his fight, uh, his political work, his uh, dreams for a better life, uh, how it could be. And even so he, Navalny himself didn't work in the sphere and in the arenas of theater we feel close to the work because also what we do i think is a fight against injustice it's a, a, a fight for progressive justice and um it is imagining a better world a different world because the world how it is does not work well um for us it works a little bit better or much better than in many parts of the world but in others like russia or in the global south and everybody does not and Milo Rao, through his work, um, has um, shown us uh, Navalny was part of Milo Rao's uh, significant work, one of his most well-known work of the Moscow trials. So first of all, uh, Milo, thank you for um, uh, joining us on such a short notice. It's over midnight in Europe. Where are you at the moment? I mean, I'm in Germany. So it's, yeah, it's just over midnight. Thanks for having me, Frank. Yeah, so it is quite a, quite an evening. We just screened the, the Navalny documentary again, the CNN documentary that is available on HBO Max. It's a very moving watching it now, knowing that it was the last time that he saw his wife and he said goodbye in that final um, scene. Also a sad thing, uh, Rene Polish, a great worker in the theater from the Gießen Institute, the lead, artistic leader of the Volksbühne Berlin, also died two or three hours ago unexpectedly. So it's quite a... Quite a, um, a sad day. Um, on the other hand, the work goes on. And Milo, I've always seen your work um, as a work of poly politics with other means and, and not as war, but in theater, in the art. Tell us a little bit um, um, about your idea of Moscow trials and how did you meet Navalny? Um, um, the story of the Moscow trials started in... Uh... I don't remember exactly when. It was like in 2010 when uh, an NGO called Memorial, you know, uh, uh, an organization that that was also declared terrorist some some years ago already now and closed. Uh, they had the, the, the Peace Nobel Prize, by the way, I think some years ago too. And they asked me to do a play about the Moscow trials, because the Moscow trials as a as a as a term are referring to the, the trial Stalin did against uh his opponents in the party and in the army in the 30s of the 20th century. So against Bukharin, against uh, uh Trotsky and everybody who was not online and didn't want to follow him into this yeah so-called Stalinism. And um I went to Russia and I remember I was in the Sakharov Center having a little speech about my plan to restage the Moscow trials. Um, and then one dissident stood up and said, yeah, but we have exactly these trials today. And uh, there were two trials at that moment. Moscow trials were three trials uh, against dissidents. And at that moment, there were already two trials against uh, two art exhibition, dissident art, ex art exhibitions in the Sakharov Center. Um, and and people were in prison or exiled or uh, not allowed to work anymore. And uh, and uh, and and I remember I started researching about these these trials and friends of mine, the pussy uh, the pussy riot, the 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 the, the, the punk group. Um, they did several concerts on the Red Square uh, in the Mac on the roof of the McDonald's and so on and so on. And I remember one day they said, OK, tomorrow we will we will play in the Holy Savior Cathedral. And everybody was like, OK, why not? Because there was no reaction. That was the, you, were the, there? The, you were in Moscow when they decided to do that. Yeah, yeah, it was in 2000. Uh, this was in 2012. And uh, and then for uh, for some reason, um, Putin at that time, I think the, the president was Medvedev, they decided to make a show trial out of it, to bring the orthodox majority of Russia closer to the regime. 
uh, to pretending that they would care for the feelings of the of the I don't know of the two ladies present in the Holy Sayyid Cathedral during this concert of two minutes, you know. So it was a completely fake trial, and two of the three went to uh, to prison. Uh, um, um, and 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 I decided to take this as the third trial that I would I would rework. So not working on the historical trials, but on the trials happening at this very time as show trials. I, I gathered all the the concept. This is very simple. I, I gathered everybody. Uh, involved in these trials, so from Pusterite, Katya, for example, then a lot of dissidents, but also a lot of, of Orthodox people. For example, uh, for, for example, Maxim Shevchenko, who, I mean, I couldn't meet him now anymore because he's having speeches in the Ukraine, in the occupied Ukraine. So he became a really, really strong hand of the Putin regime. But at that time, this kind of discussion was, was still possible. And we staged... Uh, let's say a real trial which was artificial but everything that was said and everybody who was appearing uh, in this trial was real in the Sakhov center we invited everyone that's what the film is about that you will see and one of the of the people i invited was of course also uh, alexei navalny um, who i think sometimes later would run for becoming the mayor of 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 moscow he didn't uh, but he was close and he was already very respected, I remember, at that time. Of course, there was, uh, we discussed, I think, last time I was in the, in the Siegel Center about the the little differences in, especially under a situation of political pressure in a, uh, in the, in the, for example, in the Russian opposition, that let's say the, the fights inside the opposition are as hard as they are between the opposition and Putin himself. Uh, and that's still still today it's the same and uh, and uh, and and Alexei Navalny was one and 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 you can also see it in this HBO documentary who was trying to bring together and this was very disputed also by myself when I when when I met him uh, what we in the West would call right wing nationalists together with liberal forces together with more. Uh, let's say more uh, more more classical economical uh, independent people and so on so he was he was trying to construct an opposition until his end by the way and that's i think the reason why he went back to to uh, to russia even if this was a kind of a uh, an action that was difficult to explain and uh, yeah and and the fun fact is that when you when you watch now, I think you can see him perhaps once or twice in the public. But his statement, we just cut out uh, at one point of the uh, of the editing of the film, because at that point for the for the Moscow trial itself, his statement was not so interesting. He was very much trying to be politically correct at that very moment to to bring a majority of people behind him for the for the elections so um for the film it was not so it was not so interesting what he was saying he was not so deep into the cases either he was not close to pussy right and so on but he was a uh, as you can see in the film already at that time an extremely charismatic personality and of course then after the attack in 21 i think um um, and then when he went to Berlin and then to the Schwarzwald, I mean, there he really became another figure, bigger than Khodorkovsky, bigger than Boris uh, Nemtsov, bigger than all the others, uh, bigger than Pussy Riot, even I would say. And uh, and he became this this symbol of resistance. And that he he was killed. Now I think everybody is still in deep confusion. Um, it's for me. It's a quite nice moment in the end of the documentary that you just streamed um, when he's asked, "But what will you do when you die?" And you can see in his eyes and in his voice and his reaction that he can't imagine, like nobody can imagine that he would die. It's such an absurd, such an absurd idea, and that's now what 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 happened uh, ten days ago. Yeah, we all thought it would be more like a Nelson Mandela, someone who spends a decade um, and then comes back as a powerful leader who actually can unite fronts. And what do you think um, about an opposition leader like him bridging the political antagonism? It, what did you think of his strategy to create a front? 
Yeah, I have to say that at that time I criticized it. Like, I think most of uh, uh, most of Western intellectual and artists would do. But when you were in 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 Russia, for example, for me the first shock was when I was working uh, together with Pussy Riot, and we we, we created a, a a popular tour. You know, from people from all parts of Moscow, we brought them together, like in a in a movie trial that they would give the the final verdict. So 12 people from all political backgrounds, from all educational backgrounds, from all different parts of Moscow, very from the outside, very from the center, you know, people like us, but people that were never at the university and are nationalists. And demographically, it was quite well made, this jury, but I understood quite fast that you will not find any jury in in Russia who would liberate Pussy Riot because nobody was was uh, yeah was was okay with what they they did even if it was quite clear what they did and why they did it politically and what was their statement but you saw that 80 or even 90 percent and we are talking about 2013 and as I said before when I look at this film now this country fell into darkness and you could not imagine to have this discussion in the Sakhov Center, which is, by the way, closed again. So this is not, it's like already two years later, I lost my visa like one year, or not, not even a year, like one month later. And uh, and it changed very fast. And then the first, uh, I mean, then they invaded the Crimea and then they invaded uh, two years ago now the, the whole Ukraine. Um, and... Uh, and 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 for me it was a shock to understand that 90% of russia is what we would call nationalist or right wing or at least not liberal left you know so it's a different situation and i think it's also in this in this in this movie when uh, when alexei is saying yeah of course i understand that for you from the west preaching uh, nationalists and and liberals seems to be a very strange strategy um but Russia is not a normal political context in that sense that you have these two sides and you can decide and every side is strong enough. If you would not go together somehow with Russian nationalism, which is a very, very strong dissident power too, um, I don't think that you have any chance to... Um, to, to uh, the urban elite is too small. Um, and and uh, I, I think there is, there is no other choice. Of course, what he did is that in still in 2013, he was sometimes a bit too close to really right wing uh, people, and he changed that. In a in a he learned and he changed and he for whatever reason. Um, but this is this is the biography of a politician, and I think it's super impressive. The 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 if you look at how he developed, how he strategically moved, because if you compare him with the other well-known dissidents uh, his his power his charisma his his uh, his strategy to 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 bridge and to bring together a majority i mean for example he had this this this, this strategy of what he called clever election to say that uh, even if you are not for the other candidate then putin you should vote for him and just that putin would lose some 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 uh some percentage and uh, you know all these kind of quite uh, let's say yeah in a negative term you could say quite uh, changing and even a bit opportunistic approach to what is power or in another moment in a documentary because I just watched it again he says uh, uh, what would I do if I would have the power I would divide it immediately um, and and I think all this is uh, is uh, yeah is, is part of his strategy that he over the years uh, slowly um, slowly developed and um, yeah and in 2013 this was not really not hundred uh, percent visible uh, it became visible in the dark ages because 2013 was just before the dark ages so it, you know there was the, the winter games of sochi so they opened a bit they liberated even pussy right a bit later and so on and so on they we could do our our um 
our performance in the Sakhov Center. I mean, you will see in the movie that also the the secret, the secret police they they also stop it at one point, but today you could not even start to do it, and uh, and uh, and this completely changed, and uh, yeah, and yeah, uh, that's yeah. Yeah, but most probably you would have been if you had done it even a couple of years ago. Be arrested, you would be in jail for being a foreign agent um, to destabilize uh, and, and Russia. So, um, if you look back at it, this is a piece of resistance, as you know, part of your school of resistance, your great seminars you did, um, and in the face of this political murder, you know that we now experience. Looking back at it, what do you think of it as a piece of theater? What what comes to your mind? Yeah, I I think what was very, you know, I didn't intend to do it. I I really wanted to restage the Moscow trials, the trial against Bukharin, because I was always very impressed by the by the stature of this of this historical figure. So uh, he was the intellectual of the Communist Party in the thirties, and uh, when these trials happened, there was this very beautiful quote, which is deeply Marxist, to say. Uh, I'm not guilty individually, but objectively I am guilty, you know, as the as the as the figure that I was in history as part of the of the middle class and so on and so on, and as the one who was building up Stalinism actually. And I this was for me a very Shakespearean story. But when I arrived there, and this became a bit typical for all my work I did after the Moscow trials, I immediately felt that I had to react to the to the actual context that I had to actualize this idea of the Moscow trials and uh, understood immediately that what was happening there was exactly the same what happened in the 20s already, 100 years before in Russia, that the kind of a opening society changed into uh, uh, totalitarianism again. And uh, I think it was, uh, I, I read just some days ago an interview about uh, from, from Viktor Yerofeyev, the, the writer, uh, that in Russia there were only two moments of democracy. So one was from February to October 1917, and the other one was really in the very late, in the end moments of, uh, of Gorbachev and in the beginning of Yeltsin. So there you had a little window of, of democracy too that was immediately closed again. And of course, everybody, as you said, in this Mandela logic, everybody, when you, at 2013, you had the impression, because in the 2012, you had these big man manifestations, these big demonstrations. And then in 2013, you had this, you have to, had the Pussy Riot trial, but still you had this opening. It was not 100% sure that Putin would come would come back. It was not hundred. I mean, Ukraine didn't happen. Of course, Georgia happened, but it was it was really it was another moment. And uh, and uh, there, there, there was the hope for an opening. And and uh, when I look back to this project, I exactly feel feel this uh, Fata Morgana, you know, this European hope that even Russia would become part of the European Union you know, and uh, the, the, the times of the Cold War would not come back. But yeah, history went back from where we came. And it, I mean, the story that we know from the, I mean, when you look, for me, the strangest thing with uh, Alexei Navalny dying in prison, uh, like before him, Boris Nemtsov died in prison now nine years ago, Um it's really history repeating itself. So that this would happen in Europe again, that you kill your opponents is, is really uh, is impressive because in the 70s, in the 80s, in the 90s, in the even in the zero years, this didn't happen anymore in Russia, you know? It somehow stopped. So we are before the 70s somehow. And also the invasion of Ukraine, when did the... Who, nobody expected it because it was too... It was just too absurd that uh, one of G9 would do this, you know. So all this is uh, is, uh, and you can even feel it in the in the last scene of the film uh, with 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 Alexei Navalny, that for him going back to Russia, he didn't expect what. Now there is all this this uh, this interpretation you can read in many articles that he was a kind of a holy man and he was expect this expecting this, and he wanted to confront it, etc. But I think not at all. He also grew up in a kind of a postmodern Russia, which was 
not killing its opponents. So it was not it was not happening anymore. And and so this is uh yeah, this is a changing of 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 time. Time. Um how was the atmosphere in the room and it was shown? Was it did it work? That idea of a resistance, a piece of theater, of documentary theater, theater of the re the global real, did it work? Um, when when we did it, it worked very well. It was I, I remember that we had one journalist uh, in the room. She's American, I think. We talked about her, Masha Gessen, uh, and she wrote for the New York Times uh, quite a nice text. And she was saying, and this was really the perhaps it's the format, perhaps it was the context, and it was the heat of the situation. But she she wrote after two three minutes, you completely forgot that this was not real. That this was, as you say, a kind of a mock trial, but everything was real, you know. It was like a surrealistic daydream, uh, and everything was real. And you, when you, when you, when you look at the film, you have exactly the same, uh, the same feeling of something that is happening. And uh, the, when when the advocate that we we hired, uh, which was the advocate of of Pussy Riot, and she lost the first trial the real trial and then she was asked by journalists but why would you do this trial again why do you do a staged trial and she said you know why because this is the first time that i do a trial in russia which is not staged which i don't know how it will end because nobody scripted it and that was exactly what we did and this was this surrealistic quality of it that you didn't know how it would end i remember just before the final verdict, I was I was waiting that the jury, the popular jury, would come back, and I was not sure if they would not uh, judge guilty again, pussy right, you know. But this time in the Sakharov Center, this time organized by artists, uh, and and I said, so what would this be as a message if they are judged by Putin and then again? In the center of of of, of uh, dissident intelligence, by a popular, I mean, then everything is lost somehow, and uh, yeah. But in the end, we were happy enough that it was not that was not the case, but it was close, and uh, all yeah. these elements made it uh, made it extremely real in the sense of that you don't know what will happen next and how it will end. In, it was an incredible piece of theater. I'm so glad that you, as, as part of your aesthetic work, that you document your work, that we can still see it, even we weren't there in the moment. Um, we just had you here, and you talked about your book, where you said, if you can demonstrate it on stage, you can demonstrate systems, structures. It also means you can change it, and that's why it's important to show it instead of, you know, theater showing individual, you know, stories of uh, love or the problems with the parents or lost a child or whatever to say no but in the Brechtian sense let us really show um and, and, and uh, open up apocalyptic way in the opening what's hidden um um then perhaps you know we give hope that we can change and as you say for a short moment a window opens uh, something that's uh, beyond um the visible something that is invisible um, is with us. Um, I do see your work um, um, as a work of Navalny just on a different stage, on a stage. Um, so uh, tell us a little bit. I know uh, you're now opening also um, the Vienna Festwochen and the, the Free Republic, uh, and you have a press conference coming up. So I'm saying that's also interesting. What do you do as a theater maker now in the time where we live in, like what to do? Um, and as they say uh, right now, what are you doing and how do you see it as a as an act of political resistance, aesthetic resistance, the aesthetic of resistance? Um, you know, um, Vienna, where we opened this festival, was the was the capital of modernism for reasons we don't know today. But in Europe, you know, new music. Uh, psychoanalysis, new painting, everything happened there in the beginning of the 20th century. And they also created what they called the Red Vienna, kind of a free republic in the tradition of the Commune de Paris. So really civic society taking its sovereignty, its, its, its power back from the parties, from the kings, from the army, from everything, creating for a very short time a free republic 
where everything was decided democratically by the people itself before the system again took over and uh, Europe shifted slowly to the Second World War and then to the Cold War and so on and so on. So I had the impression that now in the beginning of the 21st century, 100 years after classical uh, modernism or first modernism, we need a second modernism, you know, decentralized, perhaps not elitist, perhaps not only male, perhaps not only Central European, etc. And perhaps Vienna is an international city very close to the East, full of Russians, full of Ukrainians, full of ex-Yugoslavians, could be the place uh, to do it and to try it again and to create institutions. So, of course, we will have Vienna trials too against uh, the right-wing parties, against, but also against Wiener Festwochen itself. Uh, we created an academy that we you hosted it, the Academy Second Modernism, to network uh, female composers worldwide, and to create the uh, yeah uh, another way of producing, another way of 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 involving the public into what yeah what will become our constitution and our guideline to curate the next and the over next and so on festivals, and yeah as you say we have a we have a press conference on Friday to. To announce it together with our artists and our uh, our partners and everything, and then in May we start. And uh, we 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 took this this model of the free of the free republics of the beginning of the 20th century just to say, okay, it's an experiment that includes everything. So, for example, when you take the Alexei Navalny experiment, of course he involved the social media, he involved. Uh, public movement, he involved direct action, he involved, he made films. I mean, he was not only YouTubing a bit, he made really one hour long real films, you know, that, that good films, interesting films, touching films. Uh, he was a very good speaker, etc., etc. And I think to try to, to bring this kind of figures, we invite a lot of politicians from Russia, of course, so dissident politicians, but also from Europe, we have Yanis Varoufakis, we invite from Angela Davis from the US, by the way. So we have a lot of different people from different parts of, uh, of the globe to come to Vienna to discuss and to reflect together with us what could be the, the upcoming society, the post-capitalist society, the society that comes after these dark ages we are so deeply in in these uh, in these years now. Yeah, you're going to have I think Florentina Holzinger will come and uh, some of your composers. You did this uh, symposium also here in New York, where only two percent of uh, women were represented on musical stages, which is um, um, shocking. So tell us a bit what uh, what uh, will you change at the Vienna Festival and how do you see it in a sense of a Navalny of you know showing the new. Um, that, you know, often comes with a scare, as Heiner Müller said, but what um, and, and the, and then has beauty in it. So what is your plan to engage the city of Vienna? Um, the most the most simple example is the what you call the Council of the Republic. So Vienna is, is the one of the five biggest cities of the European Union, and there are 23 neighborhoods, you know, it's like it's a city. It's not so big. It's perhaps three million. And from these 23 um, neighborhoods, we take from every neighborhood three people. We bring them together and we mix them with the people you, you just mentioned, uh, international intellectuals, Elfrida Jelinek, Anja Arno, people that are really, um, yeah, that, that, that are the international part of it. Then we have partner organizations, for example, the Landless Movement, Rojava, and so on. Uh, that come to Vienna too, and all these people together form the Council of the Republic, to decide on how we want to curate, how who we want to invite, what will be, you talked about the 2%, what will be the quotas, do we want to have quotas, do we want to cancel people, or do we invite everybody? Perhaps you heard about this, this conflict we had uh, three weeks ago. I invited the Russian composer and the Ukrainian composer, and there was such a big shitstorm uh, and I can understand it. Even even the uh, the Ukrainian ambassador called me, and everybody said, "But you can't invite this uh, uh, this uh, this composer in this uh, this 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 conductor in this very moment." And I said, "But I think it could be a nice um, a nice constellation." But in the end, it was impossible. So we will also try to find out 
what in times of, of war uh, is still possible in this utopic space of, uh, uh, of an art festival. Of Incredible theater. to see what's possible and what's not possible to connect as in neighbors, communities, generations. And Navalny most probably uh, might have been as one of the politicians you might have invited um, to come over um, and to participate. So um, really, uh, thank you, Milo, staying for up until past midnight. You have an early flight at 8 o'clock <laughs> tomorrow, though it really uh, means a lot to us. Um, congratulations again on your work. We will follow um, what you do there. We're also trying to see if a global theater festival in New York is thinkable here in the summer and how we um, then could connect. But um, to Emily and HowlRound, I think now we move over to screen um, the Moscow Trials. It was 2013. When was it? Done? Yes. Yeah, 2013. Yeah, exactly. So have a look um, what Milo did as a reaction, you know, to go out of the theater where he was hired to do. He says, no, we should go out in the world. We should connect to what's real and we should have an impact and we should think outside um, traditions um, um, of this theater, but actually following the real world. So thank you again. And thank you. Here we go. So um, sleep well and uh, and all the best for your work and your conference. Yeah, same for you, Frank, and everybody. Bye bye.